to be. My name's Tim Wyatt and I'm one of the members of the team which helps to run the school. Now the school was formed back in 1981 by Geoffrey Farthing and others. And this year we're focusing on the study of the secret doctrine. So we'll be offering various lectures, online courses and seminars throughout the course of the year on this and a variety of other topics. So to keep updated on what we're doing, um, please register for our weekly newsletter because this explains everything. And please do try and support the work of the school if you can, because uh, we are a not-for-profit organization and almost uh, all our program is free of charge. So if you feel uh, you're able to make a donation, please do so. Um, one of the things that the school has just done very successfully is to republish uh, a vegetarian cookbook, Practical Vegetarian Cookery, which was first published back in 1897. It's by Countess Wachmeister and Kate Buffington Davis. You can buy this if you go on to the website. Now, all our online lectures, but not the seminars themselves, are transmitted live on our YouTube channel. So you can uh, register to this channel by visiting the link you see in the chat box. Uh, Juliet is also organizing a healing circle, which uh, takes place once a month. So if you'd like to participate or if you'd like to include anyone on the list in our healing book, just send an email link to eustheosophy at gmail.com. I'm just going to remind you of what we've got coming up um, in the next uh, week or so. Um, it was already been mentioned, the second of Dr. Ravi Ravindra's uh, seminars, uh, Navigating the Battle of Life, will take place next Saturday at six o'clock GMT. And then the day after, a week today, we have the geometry of nature and cosmos, the divine mind made manifest, and that's by Tom Bree. For the past 10 years, Tom has been analyzing the underlying design of the English Gothic cathedral uh, in relation to the uh, quantum trivial arts of geometry, cosmology, musical ratios, and arithmetic and he's soon to publish a long-awaited book on the subject in 2021. Uh, now, the way today's meeting will be conducted, as always, is that we've muted your microphones, and after the seminar, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can either write it in the chat box or raise your hand in the participants box. So uh, thank you for listening so far, and today we're very lucky and honoured to welcome Petra Mayer again. Um, and she's going to be speaking about Jesus and the Brotherhood of the Essenes. Uh, Petra, I've heard many of her talks and are always extremely enlightening and very well researched. Petra joined the Theosophical Society in 1991 after moving from Germany to London in 1984. Since 2016, she's been president of the Blavatsky Lodge of the Theosophical Society in England in London. So uh, welcome, Petra, and uh, I'll hand straight over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I press share screen now for the PowerPoints. Yes, please. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. So here we are. So it is about Jesus and the Brotherhood of the Saints. <clears throat> So we are going to go back a little bit in time at the beginning. The Rig Veda, which literally means praise and knowledge, is an ancient Indian collection of Vedic Sanskrit hymns and is the first and most important of the four Vedas, a claim to have been created from the mouth, Eastern mouth of Brahma and recorded in occultism dealing with the creation of the universe and having been delivered by great sages thousands of years ago at Lake Manasavara, a high altitude freshwater lake fed by the Kailash Glacier near Mount Kailash in Tibet. 
The leg is revered in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism as a very sacred place. There is an important difference between the terms Brahman and Brahma. Brahman is the impersonal, supreme, and uncognizable essence of the universe, which is unborn and eternal, without beginning or end, from which all emanates and into which all returns. It is all pervading, animating the highest gods as the smallest mineral atom. Brahma is the accent on the last A on the other end, is a creative force in nature and exists only periodically during manifestation and disappears again in regular intervals, described symbolically as the days and nights of Brahma, which is an evolutionary process of eternal thought impressed on substance or spirit matter in eternity, becoming active at the beginning of every new life cycle. A quote from the Rig Veda serves as a preface to the stanzas of Zian, which Madame Blavatsky used in The Secret Doctrine. It is a hymn of creation where we can read, who knows the secret, who proclaimed it here? Whence, whence this manifold creation sprang? The gods themselves came later into being. The most high seer that is in highest heaven, he knows it. Or perchance even he knows not. Gazing into eternity, ere the foundation of the earth were laid, thou wert. And when the subterranean flame shall burst its prison, and devour the frame, thou shalt be still as thou wert before, and knew no change, when time shall be no more. O oh, endless thought, divine eternity. In the appendix of the Mahatma letters, the Mahatma Kutumi tells us that no prophet or messenger of truth has ever achieved during his lifetime a complete triumph not even Buddha. And in the most strongest terms, he points out that the sacerdotal caste, the priesthood and the churches, ignorant of the true universal wisdom and religion, created God and gods that make two thirds of humanity the slaves of a handful of those who deceive them under the false pretense of saving them. Is not man ever ready to commit any kind of evil if told that his God or gods demand the crime? Voluntary victims of an illusionary God, he asks. For a thousand years, India groaned under the weight of caste system, Brahmins alone feeding on the fat of the land. And today the followers of Christ and those of Muhammad are cutting each other's throats in the names of and for the greater glory of their respective myths, he says. First of all, what actually is a myth? And what does it represent? The characteristic trait of a myth is to convert its subjective reflection to a historical form or eternal event, external event with which religious ideas are then interwoven, says HBB. So with the New Testament, the Western allegory founded upon the mystery of the Logos, crucified on the cross of matter and resurrected. This is precisely a substratum of pagan thought, which among other meanings is also symbolized by the rites of the resurrection of Osiris, Adonis, Bacchus, and other slaughtered sun gods the resurrection of all nature in spring, the germination of seeds that had been dead and sleeping during winter and so were allegorically said to be kept in the underworld or Hades. They are typified by the three, three, three days passed in hell before his resurrection of Hercules by Christ and others. The first historical traces of this wisdom alone in Egypt go back at least 6,000 years before the Christian era, says HPB. The allegory is in fact that of a new cycle of initiation or a new version of the universal mysteries, physical and astronomical. 
These fundamental mysteries can be found in the sacred text of every nation from the beginning of conscious human life. The prophecy of a child being born as an announcement for the return of a golden age can be found in all ages <clears throat> and among all people. A Miss Messiah is being born from a virgin mother, describing the universal principle, which is as allegorical as it is metaphysical in its hidden meaning. It has nothing to do with any particular man or any immaculate woman. The true Christians of the first century who know about the cosmic mysteries died with the last Gnostics, says HPB. They had isolated the great universal principle of a ray from the center of life or the logos, hidden from the eyes of humanity, manifesting periodically during the course of cosmic evolution. By localizing and isolating this great principle, denying it to any other except Jesus of Nazareth, carnalized the Christoph of the Gnostics. Theosophists as well as the Gnostics and Vedantins distinguish the corporeal man from the divine principle which animates him. The successors of the apostles or compilers of the Christian Bible did not record the secret doctrine of Jesus or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, they have been suppressed or destroyed. And the Christians of today are but the usurpers of a name that they no longer understand, says HBB. And she adds that the Church of Rome is the one that has wandered farthest from the real religion of the mystical Christ. She's not the only one because it has been confirmed by historians throughout the centuries and is well documented. How is it that Philo Judeus, the most accurate as the most learned of the historians contemporary to Jesus of the Gospels, a man whose birth anteceded and whose death succeeded the birth and death of Jesus respectively by 10 and 15 years, one who visited Jerusalem from Alexandria several times during his long career and who must have come to Jerusalem but a few years after the alleged crucifixion. An author, in short, who in describing the various religious sects, societies and corporations of Palestine, takes the greatest care to omit none, even of those hardly worth mentioning. How is it, as HBB, that Philo Judeus never so much as heard about a Jesus, a crucifixion, or any other event that would connect it with the so called facts of theological Christianity. The shocking answer is that the Jesus of theological Christianity had not been invented yet, as we will try to investigate now. Dogmatic Christianity is not suited for a world that reasons and thinks, wrote HBB to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And only those who can throw themselves into a medieval state of mind can appreciate a church whose religious function is to keep God in good humor, while the laity are doing what they believe he does not approve of, to pray for changes of, of weather and occasionally to beg the Almighty to help with the slaughter of the enemies, who were most of the time Christians themselves, like during the Spanish Inquisition, for example, or the victims of two world wars. The term religion is related to the Latin term religare, which means to connect, that which connects man with the whole universe, the ocean of all life. This connection defines his role in the world and gives meaning to his life. But religion that has ended up in hundreds of theological dogmas and formal rituals can become quite an obstacle on the path of human evolution, which is well reflected in a story from the Middle Ages. In this last great literary masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov, which was published in 1879, the famous Russian author and novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky included this powerful medieval and mystical fable called the Grand Inquisitor 
in his novel, which is of great educational significance now, and it was 140 years ago. Dostoevsky was a military engineer before he started his literary career. He was very disillusioned with egalitarian communism and strongly disapproved of what was called serfdom or feudal labor. In 1847, he began to participate <clears throat> in the Petrashevsky circle, which was a group of intellectuals who discussed utopian socialism. But the reigning Tsar Nicholas I was very suspicious of this circle and quite alarmed about the possibility that the revolutions in Europe, which had started in 1848, could spread to Russia as the Republican revolts against European monarchies were raging, beginning in Sicily, spreading to France, Germany, Italy, and the Austrian Empire. He saw great danger in organizations like the Petrashevsky Circle. And in 1849, members of the circle were arrested and imprisoned. A large group of prisoners, Dostoevsky among them, were sent to Semyonov Place, a town in Nizhny Novgorod for execution. As the prisoners stood lined up in the square waiting to be shot at any minute, a messenger suddenly interrupted the proceedings with a notice of reprieve or postponement for, of punishment by the Tsar at the last minute, commuting the death sentences to incarceration or imprisonment. By that time, Dostoevsky has, has passed several minutes in the full conviction that he was about to die. And in his later novels, characters repeatedly imagine the state of mind of a man approaching execution, which readers knew carried special authority because the author of the novel had gone through this terrible experience himself. In the end, instead of an execution, Dostoevsky was sent to prison. And his eight-year sentence was later reduced to four years by Nicholas I. The mob's execution led Dostoevsky to appreciate the very process of life as an incomparable gift, in contrast to the prevailing materialistic thinking of the highly intellectual groups at this time, who had great influence. The value and appreciation of freedom, integrity, and individual responsibility grew stronger with him day by day. And in 1879, he published his above mentioned final masterwork, The Brothers Karamazov, on which he had worked for two years and which contains the following poem of the Grand Inquisitor. Madame Blavatsky had made her own translation of certain passages from this famous work by Dostoevsky, including the medieval story of the Great Inquisitor which were published in the November and December editions of the magazine, The Theosophist in 1881. The translated extracts constituted a great satire or parody on modern theology. According to this old medieval legend in the days of the Spanish Inquisition, when flames rose in all cities, burning living men in the name of the Son of God with the sign of the cross, Jesus cast his eyes back over the earth and returned again among men. When he drew near to the chief square in Toledo and saw that those who cast men into the flames bore crosses in their hands, Jesus called one of them and asked, what are you doing? The answer was, we are burning heretics in the name of our holy church and in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus asked, who commanded you to do these things. And he was asked, pointed to the citadel of the city and said, our master, the chief inquisitor, who is a representative of the Holy Church, told us to do so. Jesus went to the citadel, opened the door to the inquisitor's room and asked him, in whose name are you doing all these terrible things? And the answer was, in the name of Jesus Christ, must we destroy all the heretics who can endanger his teachings? Jesus looked at him and said, I am Jesus. I brought love to you that you might love one another, that you should forgive the sins of others. 
I brought joy to the hearts of men and you changed the world into a sad house of tears. I brought love and you make the world of cruelty. I brought life and you scatter death. Order at once that the flames be put out and that the captives be freed so that my teachings may be fulfilled. The chief inquisitor looked at him and straight away began to tremble beneath the weight of his words for he felt this man was truly he, and he felt the force of Jesus' words. Minutes passed and he gave no answer. At last he lifted up his eyes and saw the official decree upon the wall. Gathering all his strength, he answered, you are right, but your ide ideal is only an ideal and cannot be achieved. Our church is a church militant, and we can conquer the whole mankind only by battle and by force. I regret it, but I cannot obey your word. Then Jesus answered, I will go back among the people and will again lift up my voice. And I will tell all that you are not my representative. I will say that I do not wish that you should put men to death or imprison them. I wish you to know that love is not hate, that life is not death. Then the chief inquisitor rose and said to Jesus, if you speak these words among the people, if you struggle against our church, I shall be obliged to burn you also, for you are dangerous. Then there was a great silence. Jesus answered nothing. But tears filled his eyes and he disappeared from before the eyes of the chief inquisitor. But from his tears there came a heavy shower of rain which put out all the flames and a flood which overthrew all the cities and all the churches. And when the waters receded, there came a new age. And they were heard in their original purity and clarity the words of love and eternal life once more. What is the true universal wisdom religion the Mahatma Kutumi was talking about in his letter mentioned above? It is that which the great Alexandrian philosopher Ammonius Sakas, who was the founder of the Neoplatonic school of the Philalesians or lovers of truth, called Theosophy or divine wisdom. Born of Christian parents, he honored what was good in Christianity but broke with the churches and dogmatism early in life, unable to find any superiority over older religions. He recognized that theosophia is the substratum of all world religions and philosophies, taught and practiced by a few since man became a thinking being. Theosophy is pure divine ethics, which has to be practiced in order to find access to higher levels of consciousness and the nature of our true essence or being, which also was also the central aspect of the teachings of the Brotherhood of the Essenes. The term Christus, for example, was never applied to any one living man, but only to every initiate at the moment of his second birth or resurrection. He who finds Christus, the eternal divine principle of deathless individuality within himself and recognizes the latter as his only way, becomes a follower or an apostle of the cosmic Christ. The coming of Christ actually means the presence of Christus in a regenerated world and not at all just the actual coming in a body of the Christ Jesus. For Christ, the true esoteric savior is no man, but the divine principle in every human being. He who strives to resurrect the spirit crucified in him by his own terrestrial passions and buried deep in the tomb of his sinful flesh. He who has the strength to roll back the stone of matter from the door of his own inner sanctuary, he has the risen Christ in him, the son of man, is a child of his own deeds and the fruit of his own spiritual labor. The name Christos or Logos, the spirit of true divine wisdom as distinct from the spirit of intellectual or mere materialistic reasoning is a higher self in short. 
The initiates alone understood the secret meaning of the term father and the son and knew that it referred to spirit and soul on the earth. For the teachings of Christ were awkward teachings, which could only be explained at the initiation. They were never intended for the masses, for Jesus repeated to his disciples that the mysteries of heaven were for them alone, not for the multitudes. The word Christos is anterior to our era by thousands of years. It was already mentioned by the Erythrean Sibyl, the prophetess of classical antiquity, presiding over the Apollonian oracle at Erythrea, promising the return of the golden age as soon as the child that has been foretold is born. This birth is as allegorical as it is mechanical and has nothing to do with any particular man. Examples are Krishna and his divine mother Devaki, Gautama Buddha and his mother Maya who conceived him in a dream, Pharaoh Emanuel III, born of the virgin mother Queen Mutemwa during the 17th dynasty, in the Sanctum Sanctorium of the Temple of Luxor are scenes of the god Thoth, the lunar Mercury, saluting the Virgin Queen and announcing to her the birth of a son. Other examples are given in HPB's article, Esotericism of Christian Dogma, where she confirms that the Testament, New Testament, is but a Western allegory founded on the universal mysteries. The Orthodox Christian Church was established centuries after Jesus' death. Like Buddha, he had never put anything down in writing. That was done by his devoted followers and manipulated to a high degree by the later church, when the true meaning of the mystery of Christ was already misunderstood and forgotten, and subsequently misinterpreted, as history reveals. In a BBC4 program on the 16th of December in 2018 called The History of Christianity, Sir Damon McCulloch, a British historian and academic specializing in ecclesiastical history and the history of Christianity, showed great courage in giving a critical account of the violent history of the church and the consequences of dogmatic Christianity, especially when it is combined with politics and the claim of supremacy. It is probably hard to, for some to swallow that the Christ of the New Testament is a construct of the Roman Church and does not portray the real Jesus, the initiate, whose roots were firmly established in the brotherhood of the saints, their unique way of life based upon pure ethics, the wisdom of the forces in nature and the laws of evolution, a brotherhood which is completely cut out from the Bible and that for a good reason, as we shall find out now. The Essenes were the converts of Buddhist missionaries who had overrun Egypt, Greece, and even Judea at one time since the reign of Alzoka, says HBB. And while it is evidently to the Essenes that belongs the honor of having had the Nazarene reformer Jesus as a pupil, Still, the letter is found disagreeing with his early teachers on several questions of formal observance. The motive of Jesus was evidently like that of Gautama Buddha, to benefit humanity at large by producing a religious reform which should give it a religion of pure ethics, the true knowledge of God or the divine and nature, having remained until then solely in the hands of the esoteric sects and their adepts. The oldest religions of the world have all the same esoteric roots like the Mazdean, Zoroastrian and the Egyptian. The Jewish esoterically as in the Kabbalah, the mystical interpretation of Genesis and the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible, a collection of allegorical legends. Read by the light of the Zohar, the initial four chapters of Genesis are the fragment of a highly philosophical page in the world cosmogony, says HPB. But left in their symbolical disguise, they are a nursery tale. To have let them serve as a prologue to Christianity was a cruel revenge on the part of the rabbis who knew better what the Pentateuch meant. 
It was a silent protest against their spoliation, wrote HPB. Who actually were the true Gnostics, keepers of the divine knowledge from the first and second centuries? The Gnostics were in fact divided into various fraternities, such as the Essenes, the Apoiti, and the Nazarenes, for example, from which Jesus originated, dedicated to asceticism from his birth. The term Nazarene has actually several different aspects, spellings, and connotations, which is not known to the general Christian anymore and is well analyzed by Dr. Karl Anders Krieger, who was initially a minister of the Evangelical, Evangelical Lutheran Church. His university studies had culminated in a doctorate for which he wrote a thesis on Sanskrit Vedic literature. He was a great opponent of Hitler's Nazi regime, was arrested in 1943, survived his ordeal, became a life member of the British Vegan Society. He wrote several books on the forgotten beginnings of early Christianity, which he partly published with the help of family and friends himself because they were so disturbing for the established churches that no editor dared to take them on. Dr. Scriva's familiarity with Eastern scriptures, his purity of life, his knowledge of ancient languages and total dedication to his cause led him to a new and unique interpretation of well-known sections in the Bible. As with the Alexandrian Philalesians, there was no religion higher than truth for him, as it is also adopted by the Theosophical Society. And it agrees with the famous saying in the Dhammapada, the Pali collection of discourses attributed to Buddha and his closest disciples. In the fourth collection called Anguttara Nikaya, not just to believe in what we have heard, or because it is tradition handed down many generations, or being written down by some old sage, not just to believe in conjecture, authorities, teachers and elders, but after careful observation and analysis, when it agrees with reason and will benefit one and all, then accept it and live by, by it. It's just another confirmation that true wisdom can only be reached by experience through pure and ethical life. Dr. Scriba used for his translation many scriptures in their earliest written forms, mainly Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic texts. Comparing them, he came, of course, very often to quite different wordings, interpretations, and conclusions. He also emphasized that it is quite significant that the order of the vegetarian living in saints is completely excluded from the Bible. And it is exactly this group of people that made the arrival of the world renewer possible. Dr. Scriba further wrote that in our traditional Bible, the renewer is always called Jesus of Nazareth. In the Greek New Testament, the name Jesus of Nazareth is only mentioned three times. Jesus the Nazarene six times. But Jesus the Nazarene or Nazoraios 12 times which is of important significance. In all those words, we find the main consonants N, Z, R of the Hebrew word Neza, which means the green branch. It refers to the prophecy in Isaiah 11. And I will use Dr. Scriva's translation from the original Greek text. There shall come forth a winged branch from the stem of divine being, and a green sprout, Neza, from its root will produce fruit. The spirit of the Lord, Adonai the Curios, will from above enter into it. The spirit of concentration and differentiation, the spirit of inspiration and strength, the spirit of gnosis and surrender to God. Jesus of Nazareth is of course a definition of where he lived and came from. But interestingly, the name Nazareth is neither mentioned in the Old Testament nor in either, uh, any other contemporary Jewish literature. Nazareth was not a geographically registered dwelling at the time of Jesus. It was a close, secluded colony of the Essenes. The term Nazarene is like Galilean, the name of his compatriots. 
But the term nasal rhyus is the most important one. Between the consonants N, Z, R, we find the vowels of the Lord Adonai. It is said that the Jews kept the name of their God Yahweh so holy that it was not allowed to be pronounced. When reading the scriptures, they replaced it with Adonai, the Lord, which is a Hebrew name for Adonis, represented astronomically by the sun. Jesus then is a promised Nietzsche on whom the spirit of the Lord Adonai rests. He is present in him. The spirit of the highest God speaks through him. When the New Testament was taken over into the Greek language, the masculine character of the Nazarai was expressed by the Greek ending Oz, which made Jesus the Nazarius, the promised one, to whom the Lord can express himself. Confirmation that the canonical gospels of the New Testament are a construction of this church during several centuries after Jesus had died, and how much they were manipulated and falsified is given by one of the very few people who had at one time the rare privilege of unrestricted access to the secret libraries of the Vatican, and who uses the same quote from the Rig Veda as an introduction to his book, Cosmos, Man and Society, like Madame Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine at the start of the stanzas of the book of Zian, which we have read before. His name is Dr. Edmond Bordeaux-Chekely. Who was he? I came across his work some 40 years ago when I started some research into early Christianity based on the information given by Dr. Bernard Zimmermann. Dr. Werner Zimmermann was the son of a Swiss watchmaker. He studied pedagogy and became very inspired by great world reformers like Mahatma Gandhi, as well as by Eastern philosophy, including the writings of Madame Blavatsky. He finally lectured at universities and governments worldwide on subjects like biological agriculture, equality, anti-atom bombs, free economy, etc. In 1945, he was awarded an honorary PhD from the University of Toronto, and in 1953, an honorary professorship from the University in Tokyo. His book, my translation to Free Shores, a record of his world travels, which he sent to me with his signature shortly before his death, is still one of my treasures. At Christmas in 1939, a South African lady brought him the gospel of peace of Jesus Christ by his disciple John, translated and edited by a Romanian philologist, philologist, philosopher and psychologist called Dr. Edmund Bordeaux-Chekely. He was very inspired by the simplicity and significance of the text and contacted the, edit edit the editor immediately for the copyright for a German translation, which was granted. Dr. Czekely had also found an old Slavonic translation of the same gospel in the Royal Library of the Habsburgs in Austria and Vienna. He copied the text and at a later visit to the Royal Library, he was told that the text had now been transferred to the Vat Library of the Vatican. It was very difficult to contact Dr. Chikli at that time, who lived somewhere in America. The war had destroyed many connecting links. Dr. Zimmermann wanted to find out where the documents of the two texts were now. So they contacted the Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana in February of 1940. And the prefect Anselmo Albareda asked them to specify which calls they wanted to see, because they had several different ones. They sent all the specific details and several reply coupons, but they never received an answer anymore. And that for an important reason, as we shall find out now. In February of 1949, Dr. Zimmer started another lecture tour around the world and visited Dr. Chakley at his insane school of life, the Society for Natural Life in Connection with the Cosmic Energies, or Rancho La Puerta at the border of California and Mexico. He wanted to find out more about the Essene Gospel of Peace, which was only partly translated and published, containing just the most important information about a healthy way of life of which humanity was in great need. Dr. Chikli told Dr. Zimmermann about the many weeks he spent in the Vatican Library, 
where he had copied all the important scriptures containing information about Jesus, but never had the time yet to translate them all. They were still stored in a big suitcase waiting for a translation. As soon as this was done, Zimmermann would be the first one to receive a copy in English for a German translation, and that was a promise. Dr. Edmund Bodo Cekeli was a descendant of the Romanian philologist and orientalist Xoma de Kuros, who compiled the first grammar of the Tibetan language, which was published in 1834 in Calcutta. Madame Blavatsky mentions him occasionally in her collected writings, but she points out that he and others could only pick up bits of knowledge from the Tibetan frontiers of Lamazaris that were thickly populated by Bhutanese and Lepshas, who are the original inhabitants of Sikkim, formerly an independent kingdom situated in the Himalayas between Nepal and Bhutan. And the Burns, which was a new religion that arose in the 11th century based on hidden Buddhist teachings and visions. And the red cat Dukbas, magicians or sorcerers along the line of the Himalayas. Even Xoma de Kuros knew very little of esoteric Lamaism, except what he was permitted to know, says HBB. For he never went beyond Zanska and the Lamas of Fagdal. The esoteric teachings were kept very secret by the initiated adepts. The highest form of adept shift was reached by the last Kobyagan, a term used for the initiates of the Tibetan Lamas, the reincarnation of a Buddha, which was Tsongkhapa of Kokonor, the reform of esoteric as well of all vulgar Lamaism in Tibet, says the Mahatma Kutumi. He founded the Gangden Monastery and the Buddhist order known as Gelukpa, the yellow head, which preserved the esoteric teachings of Gautama Buddha, especially in the scriptures known as the Book of Zian, on which the secret doctrine by HPB is based. Gangden Monastery is still one of the great Geluk University monasteries of Tibet. It is in Dangzi County in Lhasa. Dr. Chikli came from a very wealthy family. His father owned large estates in Transylvania, which is Romania today and in France. He was educated at the Catholic monastery of the Piarist order with emphasis on Greek, Latin and ecclesiastical literature. It was not easy for him to get adjusted to the austerity of Piarist life after the quite luxurious life at home, to wake up at dawn to go to mass, wash with cold water in unheated rooms, if you wanted a piece of bread or drink of water, you had to ask the prefect. But in retrospect, he was very grateful for the training in discipline and in willpower. For his doctorate, Shekely studied at the Sorbonne University in Paris and later received other degrees from the universities of Leipzig and Vienna. He also held a professorship of philosophy and experimental psychology at the University of Cluj in Romania. He was a scholar in Sanskrit, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, and spoke 10 modern languages as well. In 1928, he founded the International Biogenic Society with the Nobel Prize winning author Roman Roland, according to the ethics of the Brotherhood of the Saints. And in 1940, he started his spiritual retreat center called Rancho La Puerta on the Californian Mexican border where they grew their own plant food and lived completely according to the teachings of Jesus and the brother, same brotherhood. The seminars attracted visitors from all over the world and all walks of life. The true roots and teachings of Jesus due to the discovery of the same gospel of peace had made it possible. So what had happened? When Edmund was 18 years old, he graduated magna cum laude, always distinction, and become the valedictorian or highest achiever of his class. And his obligatory farewell address for the graduation day was a thesis on St. Francis, whom he greatly loved and adored, never expecting the chain of events that it was trigger. But right after the graduation ceremony, he was called into the office of his headmaster, 
Monsignor Mondica, the prior of the monastery, who said to him, <clears throat> well, my son, you are now ready to fly out into the great harsh world. Sometime soon, Satan will show you all the temptations of life full of pleasure and luxury. I have decided to beat Satan and steer you instead towards a great spiritual experience. I have here a letter of introduction for you to my old schoolmate, the prefect of the archives of the Vatican. But there is a price to pay for this privilege. During your studies under the prefect of the Vatican, you must subject yourself to the vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience of the Franciscan monks and live accordingly. Dress and live in the simplest way. Eat only black bread, cheese, fruit, and vegetables. Nothing else. I know your parents have great wealth, but during this time you shall not accept one penny from them. He held up an envelope and said, here you will find a very modest sum in Italian currency, corresponding to the purest unskilled worker in Italy, and you must live like one. But on the other hand, you will enjoy a spiritual banquet to be able to study under my friend Monsignor Mercati and have at your disposal the inexhaustible treasures of the ages in the archives of the Library of the Vatican. Are you willing to make the sacrifice? Young Edmund was stupefied and speechless to express his gratitude in words, but his beloved headmaster understood and handed him the envelope with a letter of introduction. What followed is a very touching story of a personal path to spiritual enlightenment and great discoveries. Motivated by the Roman philosopher Lucretius who once said, to know is to know the origin. When he finally reached the office of Monsignor Mercati, he was overwhelmed by his warmth, benevolence and profound wisdom. He had read the thesis about St. Francis and told him that St. Francis is the ocean, but that he first had to find the river nourishing it, then look for a stream, and then, when your feet are firmly on the path, you will seek out the source, he said. At first, young Edmund did not know where to begin. The secret archives of the Vatican comprise more than 25 miles of bookshelves and scrolls, parchments, papers, manuscript, and codices. But the attendants and staff of the archives were kind and helpful. Monsignor Mercati was watching his effort for some time, and one day he said to him, remember, my son, the Latin Ocean is nourished by the Greek River, which is nourished by the Aramaic stream which originates from the Hebrew source. And he assigned to him the Aramaic Hebrew guide, a French monk with whom he became fast friends. As he progressed, he suddenly felt that he was on the right track and became aware what his next step would have to be. When he approached Monsignor Mercati again to ask permission to visit the archives of the Benedictine monastery of Monte Cassino, there was a twinkle in the prefect's eyes and he handed him a letter of recommendation to the abbot, dated already the day before. And he said, I think you have found the river. Edmund spent many weeks at the most ancient of Western monasteries, watching the monks working in the garden, eating their bread and fruits together, meditating and singing. He could not help remembering Josephus the first century Jewish historian, beautiful description of the Essene Brotherhood at the Dead Sea. When he returned to Monsignor Mercati again, he was asked, did you find the stream? Edmund answered, not yet, but I shall. He was met with another probing look and after a long pause, he heard the answer, yes, you will. And he was handed a key to the locked room at the end of the corridor under the condition that the keys had to be returned to Monsignor Mercati personally. When Edmund entered the secret room, he had the impression of what an initiate must have felt when entering the Great Pyramid. And it was not long before he found what he was looking for. A few days later, when he returned the keys as promised, Asking permission to return to Monte Cassino again, Monsignor Mercati said, I'm glad that you have found the stream. 
Now I hope you will find the source. And he handed him a letter to the abbot once more, dated again the day before to let him use the vitrines in the scriptorium. Edmund delved into the archives of Monte Cassino like a fish returning to water. He poured over the complete text of Josephus, Philo and Plinius, along with Latin classics, the beautiful manuscript of San Jerome, many of these priceless works generally being considered lost, long lost, but had survived. And then he finally found the source, Hebrew fragments of the Essene gospel in the Aramaic version. When he returned this time to the office of Monsignor Mercati, there was something new in the prefect's expression, a kind of sympathy, compassion, mixed with sorrow for the misfortunes of others because he knew about the responsibility and the decision one has to make after finding the source of wisdom. I have found the source, Edmund said quietly. I know, answered Monsignor Mercat. You have that look. Tears filled Edmund's eyes and he meekly asked, what shall I do, Father? Let St. Francis sing in your heart, was a whisper. Edmund knelt, kissed his hand, and heard the final and shortest letter in the Latin alphabet, E, which means go. He went and never saw his mentor again. What was it that young Edmund found so disturbing and which shook him to the core? Something the prefect had known all along and felt helpless to act upon, but wanted Edmund to find out as well probably in the hope that he would be able to act upon it in his later life. He most certainly did. The disastrous discovery was that there, have been, there had been two Christs, a Latin term which has the same meaning as the Hebrew word Messiah, and whose personalities and aim could not have been more different. In his book, The Essene Origins of Christianity, for which he labored more than 20 years, the turbulent and violent history of early Christianity unfolds itself. Dr. Chikli examined the documents of all exegetes who have studied the origins of Christianity. Exegesis is a term of the specific church vocabulary, which means exposition or explanation of texts and documents concerned with the origins of Christianity. But etymologically, the Greek term exegesis signifies guiding, leading, steering. And this is what exegesis does, steering. But all the exegetes flounder in the bog of muddy ground of Eusebius, says Dr. Chakely. Eusebius was a Christian historian of great influence and power from the fourth century AD and whom, thanks to his great linguistic scholarship and unrestricted access to the Vatican Library, Dr. Czekely, like Madame Blavatsky, could expose as one of the greatest manip manipulators of documents and fraud. In her collected writings number nine, Madame Blavatsky calls Eusebius of Caesarea king of falsifiers. And in her collected writings, volume five, that he stands accused in history of perverting every Egyptian chronological table for the sake of synchronism. Non-Christian documentation upon the central figure of the gospels are scarce, says Dr. Jacob, not because that person did not exist, but because documents contradicting the ecclesiastical account of the origins of Christianity have been suppressed and falsified. Dr. Chakely has compared all the writings which either mention Jesus Christ or make allusions to him. Certain writings are called canonical. The Greek term canonical means measuring rule or list and conforms to the rule drawn by the church favorable to her authorities. Then there are apocryphal writings, books which should remain hidden. In the early days of the church, only parts of these writings which suited her purpose found their way into the canonical gospels. Other parts were destroyed. There are also heretical documents which the church regarded as regrettable. And agrafa, 
or lost sayings of Christ, of which only a few citations have remained in the works of various scribes. Finally, there are the apologetic or justifying and numerous controversial works, including the ones of the early church fathers, to which the church attaches great importance. It is from these retouched and harmonized works that she succeeded in the manufacturing of the gospel, perverting and destroying the historical tools of the original ones. From a point of view of history, it is very often the most canonical among all the writings that are the most falsified, says Dr. Chekli. Due to his probably unmatched linguistic skills and the unrestricted access to the Library of the Vatican, Dr. Chekli is, according to my research in comparison with theosophical writings, the most reliable and best informed scholar of early Christian history, which brought amazing historical events to light. He emphasized the importance of comparison and assessment of all the scriptures available from the first early centuries of Christianity. They must be analyzed from the political condition of the Roman Empire, the environment, religion, race, and nation of Jesus Christ in Judea, and the messianic expectations of the Zealot Jews. The Zealots were a political movement in the first century Judaism which sought to incite the people of Judea province to rebel against the Roman Empire and expel it from the Holy Land by force and arms to restore the kingdom of Israel again and the sovereignty of the Jews over the world under any circumstance and by force. At the time in question, the Roman Empire was at the height of its fullest political splendor and military power. There's a wealth of information from the times of the Roman Emperor. The capital city was always very well informed about everything done within the frontiers of the empire. Roman garrisons were quartered throughout the provinces. Palestine in particular was watched over by large military forces because it was in a state of constant insurrection and subject to outbursts of the most intense messianic fanatism known to Jewish history. This was a violent stage for the crucified by Pontius Pilate, whom the church confounds or mixes up with the real Essene Jesus, who never took part in any political upheaval. Throughout the first century, right up to the time of the destruction of the Jewish nation in 135 AD, no Greek and Latin writer and no church scribe knew the Jesus Christ of the gospels and Christian writings, because at that time they simply did not exist. But interesting is that all the Latin historians like Tacitus, Flavius Josephus, Quintilian and Apuleius, as well as some Greek writers knew about the Messiah Christ who was crucified by Pontius Pilate, the leader of a Jewish radical messianist movement called the Christists, who was pursued by Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate the Roman procurator of Judea for seven years until he was eventually captured and crucified. The Christists and later called Christians were waging a war of unheard violence against the Greek and Roman cults and other religions. Dr. Chicli agrees with Baron de Montesquieu who was a French judge and political philosopher that the conquerors like the Romans never persecuted people for their religion, including the Jews, nor did they send missionaries to impose their gods on others. Theosophy, like demonstrated in Isis Unveiled and Collected Writings 8 is in total agreement with Dr. Chekulis. Oh, I think I lost my in Dr. Chekli's research that the Jesus of the Bible is an invention of later centuries. It was a projection of the universal mystery, the logos or Christ consciousness, coming to its full expression in a physical human being like Buddha or Jesus. The violent history of the historical role of the self-proclaimed Messiah had to obliterate it in order that the God Jesus could be created that the gospels were read upon dogma, 
They were the outcome of a literary labor of five centuries. Just a second. <laughs> the aim of the Christist's preaching was not to convince reasoning, but to convert through faith and force. They even threatened one another with the most terrible punishment. The historian Amianus Marcellinus once wrote that there are no beasts as savage as the Christists among themselves. The crucified of Pontius Pilate was in reality a pretender to the throne of Judea and not the same Jesus. He was imprisoned under the name of Johannes, a contraction of the Chaldeo semi term Johannes, meaning God or universal life from which the Hebrews derived their Yahweh. The claimant to the throne of Judea invested himself with this magical name when he published his manifesto, pretending, pretending to be the promised King Messiah. His father was not the God, Joseph of the Gospel, but a handsome looking man from a respected family, the founder of Messianism, a sect from which emerged the Christists or later the Christians. He was a great leader of troops and was involved in all political events in Palestine and eventually killed during a revolt against the Romans in 7 AD. He came from Gomala, the Judean city situated at the southern part of the Golan Heights overlooking the Sea of Galilee. There was also born his oldest, eldest son, the self-proclaimed Messiah Christ. After a series of riots and rebellions, he was arrested. And when set free again, he immediately began a new brutal campaign. He risked his final attempt at the great Sabbatic Passover at the beginning of the first century. There's no consensus among historians on the exact details. He failed, fled, was pursued by the cavalry, finally captured, deserted by most of his friends, and crucified on Thursday, the 15th day of Nisan, on the eve of the Passover. On the same day as the capture of the Christus Zelots Johannes, the peaceful Saint Jesus was also captured as he wandered through the countryside by a new centurion who had only just arrived from Sicily and did not know yet which sect members were wanted for arrest and which were not. And both of were brought to Pontius Pilate for interrogation. Pilate immediately perceived the sincerity and spiritual depths of the harmless wanderer. And according to Strabo, a Greek geogra geographer, philosopher, and historian, gave instructions to the centurion to immediately release the prisoner. The other prisoner, Johannes Christ, was lawfully tried for murder, convicted and executed according to the Roman law. The effort of the Messianist Christ scribe was always and by all means to confuse these two prisoners and almost succeeded due to the term Barabbas. Barabbas is in fact not a name, wrote Dr. Chikli, but literally means the son of the father to be able to discriminate between the two. And it was also used for the same Jesus. But when Jesus said, my father and I are one, he meant the essence and law of the universe, which he manifested. And this son was the prisoner whom Pontius Pilate released, the Jesus of the Brotherhood of the Essenes. This cover-up led to the second greatest fraud of the Messianist tribes, the attempt to completely eradicate the existence and memory of the Essenes. Although the Essenes, according to Josephus, enjoyed a high moral reputation among the various Jewish sects, but are completely absent from the Venoptic Gospel of the Bible. According to the first century historians, like Josephus, for example, Philo of Alexandria, whom Madame Blavatsky also mentioned before as one of the most reliable sources of historical events at the time of Jesus, and who had never heard of a Jesus and a crucifixion, as well as the Roman Pliny the Elder, who all wrote about the saints and had emphasized that they were erased by themselves, more remarkable than any other in this wide world. They were regarded as the oldest of initiates, receiving their tradition from Central Asia. 
The daily practice was very different from the rest of the Jews. They never ate meat and took no other drink than rainwater and the juice of fruits and studied ancient writings with great perseverance. They were very fond of music, which was part of their life, opposed to dwell in big cities and always lived in the country by lakes and rivers, dressed in a single white garment, and their meals were taken in silence. Their collective occupation was agriculture with additional studies from medicine to astronomy. They always stressed, as we have heard before, that to understand their teachings, it was necessary to live the life from, to, to live the true life for many years and to change oneself physically, intellectually and morally. And they taught reincarnation. <clears throat> They had a three year novitat before they ex were accepted in the, into the brotherhood. And after seven years of inner life, candidates were slowly initiated into the traditional sequence over the subsequent years until they had attained the highest degree of comprehension. They had celibates among them as well as married folk to secure the continuity of their brotherhood. They were the only sect to be without enemies and escaped criticism from even the most ironical writers. <clears throat> they did not believe in nor did they describe an anthropomorphic God. The book of creation starts without beginning. The law creates thought and life, present tense instead of past tense, an ongoing process. In the place of God, they place the tetragrammaton, which for them symbolized the law. Heaven is replaced by thought, earth by life or living matter. The tetragrammaton not only symbolized the four consonants Y, H, W, H for the Jewish God, highest God Yahweh, but it also shows some very interesting racial relationships, assigning numerical value to a word. It is likely that the term derived from the order of the Greek alphabet, gamma being the third letter, Gamma and Tria from Greek Geometria, which is very well explained on the web under the Tetragrammaton and its relationship to Phi, the golden ratio, similar to the secret doctrine where I are told that deity geometrizes, working in cycles and on a strict geometrical and mathematical scale of progression. God is understood as the law of the universe. It is behind all manifestation of life materially or immaterially. It is our teacher in all of nature if we have eyes to see. We punish ourselves and we deviate from it. Creation, so also we would probably call emanation or materialization, is continuous and eternal, is permanently active in human consciousness as well as the material universe. It is a cosmic ocean of life made up of the totality of all living beings on all the life containing planets and cosmic space. There's no distinction between organic and inorganic matter. Everything is alive. It could not be more theosophical. Besides the cosmic ocean of life, there is a cosmic ocean of thought, regarded as a cosmic function and not restricted to our planet or man living upon it a solidarity between all forms of life. Things are not finished and complete, but connected in a permanent dynamic activity, a reality that moves and lives. There is no static point in either nature nor man. Everything moves and evolves. But behind the totality of the laws of life and the universe was a supreme power. The ocean of thought is its vehicle to which every enlightened being contributed. For the essence, light had two aspects. It is the eternal cosmic ocean of thought and consciousness. And secondly, it is human consciousness as an individualized part of this eternal cosmic ocean of thought. By communion with the forces of nature, which the essence called angels or agents of the earthly mother, a healthy body can be sustained. These forces are angels for the sun, water, air, earth, life, and joy. 
the angels of the heavenly father can sustain the healthy spiritual and eternal aspect of a human being by constant communion with the forces of love, wisdom, strength, eternal life, work and peace. In the same gospel of peace book for teachings of the elect, Jesus says, the son of man is not all that he seems. And only with the eyes of the spirit can we see those golden threads which link us with all life everywhere. This most powerful of the angels of the heavenly father is the cause of movement. And only in movement is life. Seek the angel of peace in all that lives, in all you do, in every word you speak. For peace is the key to all knowledge, to all mystery, to all life. I tell you truly, there's a holy stream of life which gave birth to the earthly mother and all her angels. Invisible is this stream of life to the eyes of the sons of men, for they walk in darkness. But the sons of life have walked for seven years with the angels of day and of night, and now they are given the secret of communion with the angels, and the eyes of your spirit shall be opened, and you will see and hear and touch the stream of life that gave birth to the earthly mother. And you will enter the holy stream of life and it will carry you with infinite tenderness to everlasting life in the kingdom of your heavenly father. Some asked in amazement, what secret must we know to see, hear and touch this holy stream of life? Jesus did not answer but he placed his two hands around the growing blades of grass in a pot, gently, as if it were the forehead of a little child. He closed his eyes and around him were waves of light, shimmering in the sun as the summer heat makes the light tremble under a cloudless sky. The heavenly father is the one law, he later said. All in our understanding and all we know not, all is governed by the law. The whole of his kingdom may be found in the smallest drop of dew on a wild flower or the scent of the newly cut grass in the fields. There are no words to describe the kingdom of the heavenly father. But there will come a day when the son of man will turn his face from his earthly mother and betray her, selling her into slavery, her flesh being ravished, her blood polluted and her breath smothered. He will bring the fire of death into all the parts of her kingdom and his hunger will devour all the gifts and leave in their place only desert. That sounds very familiar. All these things will he do out of ignorance of the law. As he plunders and ravages and destroys his earthly mother, so does he destroy himself. For he was born of his earthly mother, he is one with her, and all that he does to his mother, so does he to himself. I tell you truly, the book of nature is a holy scroll. And if you would have the sons of men save themselves and find everlasting life, teach them how once again to read from the living pages of the earthly mother. Only when he returns to the bosom of his earthly mother will he find everlasting life and the stream of life which leads to the heavenly father. For the heavenly father is the one law. Glorious indeed is the inheritance of the son of man. But first he must seek and find peace with his body, his thoughts, his feelings, with all sons of men, his holy knowledge and the kingdom of the earthly mother. He must have peace that is sevenfold before he can know the one peace which surpasses all understanding, even that of the heavenly father. And the brothers knelt and bowed their heads in reverence before the power of the angels. And no one knew if an hour had passed or a year, for time stood still. And it was as if all creation held its breath. I have reached the inner vision and through thy spirit in me, I have heard thy wondrous secret. Through thy mystic insight, who has caused a spring of knowledge to well up within me. A fountain of power pouring forth living waters. 
a flood of love and all embracing wisdom, like the splendor of eternal light. Once I was in a great cave temple in the Himalaya mountains with my master, said HBB. She looked at the picture of the splendid Rajput. There were many statues of adepts there. Pointing to one of them, her master said, this is he whom you call Jesus. We count him to be one of the greatest among us. Peace be with you. Thank you very much. Could you stop sharing your screen, please, Petra? We can stop the scene, this scene, the screen sharing. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for an absolutely inspirational talk. I think we all have a lot to consider. Before opening for questions, um, Graham asked if you could please give us the titles of the books that you were quoting. Um, yes, you know, I got my books uh, right from um, Costa Rica. 40 mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, this uh, spiritual uh, retreat center still exists and it's running by Jekyll, one of Jekyll's daughters, but the headquarters are in Canada now. And if you Google the International Biogenic Society, International Biogenic Society okay. in Canada, they have all the titles which are still available and they're not as cheap anymore as they were <laughs> 40 years ago but uh, um, you can find all the titles are quoted uh, uh, and, um, at the International Biogenic Society. Okay Graham would you like to unmute yourself yeah. and ask I think your I have. Question? Brilliant thank yes. you. So, so is there actually a book called the Essene Book of Creation? No, it is all taken from books. I mean, um, J. 